Well, hello there. Welcome to Module 6, Genetics. And just like some previous chapters, I'm going to go off the book a little bit. This is uh, Chapter 20, Patterns of Genetic Inheritance. We're going to kind of jump around the order of the book a little bit from this point on. And, you know, personally, when I first learned genetics as an undergrad, um, it was not my favorite subject in biology. And it was, uh, to me, a little bit boring. There's a lot of numbers, a lot of statistics, a lot of counting things, and a lot of rules and mathematical rules that, that then you had to learn about how those rules were often broken. So, and it was not very much engaging for me. And the reason I bring this up is over the years I've taught biology, and whenever I teach, I like to prepare myself by listening to other professors and other speakers. And I like to give credit where credit's due, and there's a professor out of MIT, Dr. Eric Lander, who's a geneticist. He's a mathematician by trade, but he ended up going into genetics. And uh, I was watching an undergraduate biology course where he was introducing genetics, and it was absolutely fascinating. And I'm hoping um, to do the same thing for you, what he did for me, and that's it made genetics engaging and really, really interesting. And he did so by first and foremost talking a little bit about history. So before we get into all the statistics and the math and how this stuff all works, I want to kind of tell you about how our knowledge of genetics, genetics really came about. Now, when you think about genetics, we think about passing traits from parent to offspring. And we didn't always call it genetics. We used to just call it breeding. You know? And really, this subject and science of breeding came into uh, a lot of prominence several hundred years ago actually, especially with the age of exploration when all of a sudden ships were going out of Europe especially and bringing back interesting plants, fruits and vegetables and animals from all over the world. And they were learning that not only can they bring back these new and interesting spices and foods and what have you, but there would be a demand for them. So quite often, as many things in history, um, here's where actually money actually drove, ended up driving research because it was shown that, hey, not only could we bring out back all these different, maybe say types of apples, but we could actually cross them and create whole new types of apples and there'd be a demand for them. And not only was there demand, but now that we had the shipping and once again, more and more lines of, uh, of transportation coming about, you could not only just create better apples for yourself and your family, but you knew, now had new lines of distribution and you, can, you could go and sell them many other places. So there was a lot of demand, okay, to be able to produce a better crop, a better product. Now, specifically in about the mid-1800s, in the middle of the Austrian-Hungarian Empire, um, there is a city called Brno, and it became kind of famous. And the reason being is, let me back up, that the center of the Austrian-Hungarian Empire, in fact, let me go ahead and kind of show you right here. Here is Brno right now in the middle of the Czech Republic, right here. And they were the center of pretty much the textile industry and so they made clothing and of course they made it from wool well the thing was is that Spaniards down here in Spain started to actually get lots of different types of sheep from breeding from various types of sheep that they've um, got, gotten in their travels so all of a sudden the textile center of the world at the time where they made all their money right here in, the, in this Austrian-Hungarian Empire right all through here their dominance was being threatened because Spain was coming up with a whole bunch of really different types of quality wool so they decided in order to once again maintain their dominance in the textile industry that they needed to understand more about breeding so they started to get the best and the brightest minds together and they would have these little institutes that were specifically studying breeding. Now, one in particular wasn't studying wool necessarily, it was actually more studying plants. 
and the president of the society and this once again these societies were like a little imagine little brain trust trying to figure out how to breed better well the president of the society was one cf knapp and not only was he a president of the society but he was also the head of the augustinian monastery in brno and he he recruited the best and the brightest students to the monastery to do research so he would recruit these you know these young men to become monks but they were also consciously doing research on breeding so why do I bring this up I bring this up because of Gregor Mendel now if you ever had biology you've probably heard of Mendel you've probably heard of Mendel this little monk who breeded who bred I should say uh, who bred peas and flowers and stuff and from these from these his little research and his little tiny monastery and his little garden all of a sudden we get all the rules of genetics or the majority of our foundational rules of genetics and the, the impression in the in the textbooks is oh here's this little isolated monk and he had nothing better to do other than to count peas and pea pods it Mendel studying genetics was no accident okay it wasn't just some random coincidence and he was bored and he started counting peas all right it was actually the culmination of really hundreds of years of socioeconomic uh, factors that actually led to him studying breeding, led to him studying genetics. So the CF Knapp recruits this kind of young, poor kid, but very, very bright, Gregor Mender, Mendel, to the monastery. And in a sense, this monastery was, once again, kind of like the equivalent of modern day Caltech or MIT or what have you. It was a biotech incubator. And the other great thing to understand about Mendel, now that you understand he wasn't just some lowly little monk who was bored and was counting up pea pods, is that what we can learn from Mendel is how to do really good science. And that's what I want to stress upon here. Not just the rules of genetics that he came up with, but he actually shows how to do really good science. So let's, let's look briefly at what he did. So what did he do? The very first thing he did is he set up a system. He set up an experimental system. And we're going to he started with peas and he actually studied many things. But he's we're going to talk about peas. He took different varieties of peas and he grew them. But Here's the thing you want to remember. If you need to stud, if you want to study something, you want to be able to start with something. If I'm going to study inheritance, this is more or less what he said. If I'm going to study inheritance, I must study things with constant properties. What does that mean? That means he would have to continually breed these peas, okay, until they bred true. What do I mean by that? We're going to look, and the two, um, there were many traits, but I'm, we're going to start with just two. The classic are round, round peas versus wrinkled peas. And what he would end up doing is continually self-populating these. So he would take the the he would learn to take a paintbrush, and from the male part of the plant, and then paint it onto the female part of the plant, and he would basically self-populate it. So it populates itself until you would consistently always get the same result. Round would always give you round and wrinkled always, no matter what, gave you wrinkled. So he set up his experiment, he set up his, his system so he knew no matter what happened, if he bred a wrinkled by itself, it's always going to give you wrinkled and if you 
bred one of these round by themselves, it was always going to give you round. He set up the system with constant properties. And what I want you to appreciate here is this probably took years. Just setting up a system so he was guaranteed to know exactly what he was going to get whenever he self-populated probably took years just to set up the system. This shows he took careful experimental design. took a lot of insight. To do that. Okay. So once he had constant properties, he set up his system. He knew they were they always bred true. Now we're ready for a controlled cross. So instead of self-populating where the once again we're always you know populating with with themselves now we're going to do a controlled cross so what I'm going to do with a control, controlled cross is I am going to now take a round and we're going to cross it with a wrinkled all right, and we're going. To, this is our initial generation. I'm going to notate that as F naught. Okay, and the reason F we use in genetics quite a bit is for filial, meaning children. So this is the parental generation, F naught, F zero. Okay, so that's the parents. What we really want to look is what's going to happen in the F1 generation, the first generation, when we cross these two plants. And guess what we get? In the first generation, round. Wrinkled is gone. All gone. None whatsoever. whatsoever. Gone. And think about it. If we take a round and a wrinkled, what would you kind of expect to happen if you have two very opposite traits here? Well, if you took a poll at the time and you asked people what would probably happen, they probably said, well, probably slightly wrinkled, a little, little puckered, kind of a combination between the two. N you know, not, you know, it, it's kind of just this little blend. Because typically when we cross things, that's what we see what we get when we see, especially when I look at two different, an offspring of two people, now that's a little extreme example, it looks like a combination of both parents, not just one parent. Now mind you, we're looking at thousands of traits when we're looking at individuals or even, even if I just look at a plant, I'm crossing plants, it's usually a blend of the two plants. That's because we're looking at multiple traits on multiple genes. But now I'm looking at just one very specific trait carried on one gene is what we're going to find out, okay? And what we find is wrinkles gone, just disappeared, boom, all, all, um, all, all round, all smooth. So that was interesting. Now, that was when we took, once again, the parents being a round and a wrinkled. Well, what can we do next? Well, what if we self-populate? Like just like we did up here, now we're going to once again self-populate these guys with themselves. We're going to once again take our little paintbrush very carefully. We're going to take some um, from the male organ stamen and put it on put it on the female part of the plant and we're going to self-pollinate uh, it, right? I said population, self-pollination, excuse me. That's a little slip up on my part. Pollination is what I meant to say. So, and so once again, I'm, we're going to self self pollinate again here, and see what happens. And what are we going to do? What are we going to find in the F2 generation when we self pollinate? And we're going to find is we're going to find some smooth 
and we're gonna find some wrinkled. So some smooth and some wrinkled. Now, what's surprising about that? Quite frankly, wrinkled came back. And it didn't just come back once again, kind of a blend or anything like that, like slightly puckered. It came back 100% wrinkled as this parental generation way up here. So he set up his system. He did his experiments. What did he do next? He counted. And he wanted to see what he found. And what he found in this initial F2 generation, and once again, it took him a while to count, 5,474 round. and 1,850 wrinkled. Hmm. Kind of interesting two numbers, don't you think? Well, what does that look like? Well, if I do the ratio, what is that? Well, that's 2.96 round for every one wrinkled. And here, once again, is one of the reasons that Mendel shows great science. He set up his careful experimental design. He did his experiment very carefully. And then he counted. And then he said, what is... The what are the data trying to tell me? And by the way, I always have to catch myself because I always want to say what is the data, but data inherently is plural, so it should be what are the data trying to tell me properly. So what are the data trying to tell me? And he says, you know, that really looks like a 1 to 3 ratio. So in other words, he was being very intuitive, trying to say, what is the data trying to tell me? So then what happened? Well, he would do it again, and he would do it again, and he'd repeat the experiment. And it would never be exactly 1 to 3 ratio. It could be 2.94 to 1, 3.01 to 1. But pretty much he said consistently that there's this 1 to 3 ratio going on. Now, there were times when he would get totally aberrant data. In other words, not even close to one, point, uh, 1 to 3 ratio. And guess what he did with that data? He threw it out. And some people actually get, get on his case for that, if you will, for throwing out data. But you have to remember, once again, he's working with plants in a garden. And if he didn't pollinate manually pollinated fast enough, maybe the winds came in and they were pollinated by other plants. So he had to realize that it wasn't a super controlled situation and sometimes the experiment just gets befuddled and messed up, especially in a situation where something as simple as wind could throw it off. So if he got completely aberrant data where he wasn't getting this one to three ratio, he had said, okay, well, the experiment tanked. And he threw out that data. And that's okay in research. I mean, you don't want to do that all the time. But if you realize hey, that, hey, this data is completely aberrant, it, it doesn't make sense, you have to say, what went wrong? And is there something wrong with my experimental setup? So what happens next? Well, he's getting this 1 to 3 ratio. And he decides to publish his findings. He tries to get things published. And remember, whenever you publish something in science, right, he, you want to be able to publish your data, but you want to be able to explain it. And so the next thing he did is he made a model. 
and basically he's saying okay these are two different traits and he's saying that one trait is going to dominate over another one so we're going to say that in this case over here round is represented by large R but this trait is carried from two, uh, two different genes one from one from each parent one from mom and one from dad so this one is big R big R and this one is little R little R these are the ones that we started with that remember bred true that's what we started with so here's his model and he said okay well when I breed big R big R and little R little R round and wrinkled and we're going to learn that this is called a uh, Punnett square here's what's going to happen R R here from each parent there's it, each parent is going to donate one of these two traits we don't know at this point he didn't know where these traits were carried but the parents are going to donate one of each each one of these so from this parent number one here versus parent number two if parent number one do, no, donates this one and parent number two donates this one this is what I'm going to get parent number one donates this one Parent number one donates this one. This is what I'm going to get. And you're going to see I'm going to get the same thing in all four of these boxes. And because R, we're going to find out, is going to dominate here, that's why in this self pollen, that's why in this first generation, wrinkled's gone because we have this dominant trait right here. And then what did we do? We took this RR. And we self pollinate it. So then now my Punnett square would look more like this R, 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 R. So now let's look what happens. Well, I have big R, big R. I have big R, little r. I have big R, little r. And over here I have little r, little r. Well, there's no big R over here, so this would be wrinkled. right and these guys over here would all be smooth and once again there's my 3 to 1 ratio so he made a model he made a model and just like nowadays if you want to get something published you send it in to get published you send it to the publisher and it goes out and it gets peer reviewed so it sends out to some independent reviewers that are that you don't know and nothing happens and why does nothing happen well because he made a model but that's all it is it's a model you have to be able to really prove your model so how do you prove this model how do you prove this model well we can make some predictions. We can make some interesting predictions. Let's say we decide to cross one of these F1 generations with a bread true from this first generation. Well, then that could be something interesting because if I breed one from the F1 generation that I know is RR. Remember, that's all we got there. And I cross it. Let's say, actually, I'm going to cross it with a wrinkled. So I'm going to take one of these right here, which I now know I'm representing by this. Okay. And I cross it with lower, a little r, little r. What am I going to get? Well, in this case, I'm going to get a ratio of round to wrinkled of 1 to 1. Because let's look at that. Once again, I'll do another little square. R, R, 
R R and you can see that my products my offspring are one to one ratio of round to wrinkled we could do it a different way we could actually once again take um, and when they maybe the F2 generations right now we're seeing we've got this three to one ratio here but honestly we don't know exactly if, if a round is going to be big R big R or big R little r so if we just take one of these rounds or we start breeding a whole bunch of these rounds against once again a wrinkled these three with a wrinkle here well, one third of these are going to be big R, big R, and two thirds are going to be big R, little r. Well, that means one third of them will be big R, and cross that with little r, which we just saw over there is a one to one ratio, right? one to run, but then two-thirds of them will be big R cross little r. Oh, excuse me, this is the one-to-one -one ratio over here. This is the one, excuse me, this is the one-to-one -one ratio. And these will all be, excuse me, these are all be, one-third of them will all be round, and two-thirds of them will be one-to-one -one ratio round to wrinkled, excuse me. So, you can see that's where the master is getting in, but now he had a model and he could make predictions. He could cross them again to make predictions. So once again, he writes his paper. And what happens next? Here's, here's Mendel's paper on the basics of, of breeding and this model where we're getting traits that are carried from parent to offspring and how one trait can dominate. And what's going to happen? It sank like a stone. No one really read it. Once again, it was published in 1865 is when poor Mendel's paper was published. And no one paid much attention to it. Now, what happened to poor Mendel? Not much. He kind of stopped studying breeding, stopped studying genetics, went on to study a little astronomy, and then he became abbot of the, of the monastery, and that's pretty much it for poor Mendel. That's the last of what we hear from him. No one paid much attention, including a lot of very famous people at the time kind of ignored it, including Charles Darwin. And in fact, many of the questions that Darwin had about evolution, a lot of answer, things that he couldn't answer, would have been answered by Mendel's paper. However, Darwin never read it. He had it. But back in the, those days, whenever you had a published book, it was sealed and you really had a knife to kind of cut open the, uh, the loose end of the book in order to read it and Mendel's paper was actually found in Darwin's possession but he never read it, he never sliced it open, he never read it. So 1865 comes and goes and nothing happens with poor with poor Mendel. He thinks his research just has gone nowhere. But then, in the late 1800s, Mendel's gone, and we have cytologists. I'm just giving myself some more room to write here. And you know what cytologists are, because we just got done looking at cells. And those are people who study cells. And cytologists studying cells notice 
these funny structures. And th they noticed that when you stain them with a dye, a very particular dye, these funny structures stained very brightly. And they notice that these funny structures, when a cell goes under, undergoes cell division, mitosis, they all line up like these X's in the middle. And then, this is just normal cell division for like cell repair and growth and what have you. And then they separate to opposite ends as the cell divides. So excuse my have a crude, this is my cell division here. So these very funny colored things separate as they, as the cell divides into two. Okay? What they also noticed though was that in, this is mitosis, When we looked at meiosis, which we're going to be studying both of these in depth, which is the making of gametes, the making of sex cells, the making of sperm and egg, what ended up happening is, instead of, there's actually two sets of divisions, instead of lining up along the middle like this, these things would line up in pairs. And when they divide and go across the these pairs that seem to be equivalent. So I'm going to pick a big one and a big one here and a little tiny one and a little tiny one. They match up in pairs. And so what ends up happening is each one, if I started with eight, gets half as many as the original parent. So I go small, middle, middle, big. And then it divides again, where it looks a lot like mitosis. And we end up with, for these cells, each with half as many, once again, I started with one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, half as many of these colored things. Well, whenever you discover something new in science, first thing you want to do, even if you don't know what it does, first thing you want to do is name it. So, they named them. These things that stain brightly. And they named them chromosomes. Literally meaning colored things. Seriously. Chromosomes. Colored things. Didn't know what they did, but what they did notice is that once again, we're noticing that these things are splitting off into pairs in meiosis. And these, this is actually making once again the gametes, the sex cells, that'll eventually go on to, you know, sperm and egg to actually go ahead and come together later on to make an offspring. And we see these pairs lining up. And they said, hey, that sounds a lot like the stuff that the, that dead monk wrote about in 1865. So all of a sudden there was this resurgence in Mendel's work because Mendel's work was just you know, a model with a theory, but he, there was nothing tangible to it, nothing that we could see, but now we could see. We could see these color things, we could see these chromosomes, and we could see how that they line up in pairs when we're making the sex cells, and those sex cells, once again, are then going to define the offspring. So all of a sudden there's this huge resurgence in Mendel's work. Now, a couple, couple terms that I want to go over with you really quickly.
All right, so a couple quick terms. First and foremost, genes. So when we say the word genes, don't jump to chromosomes in your brain yet. Um, yes, they're carried on those chromosomes, but for right now, genes are just factors of inheritance, just traits, or a control, excuse me, factors of inheritance that are gonna control a trait. All right, so factors of inheritance that we're gonna get from parents and gonna give it to the offspring, inheritance that are gonna control a trait. Alleles are alternate, uh, alternative forms of those genes. And we've already seen this. We saw the big R versus little r. So those are different factors of inheritance. One you're gonna get from each parent, you're gonna get an allele from each parent. You, so everyone's gonna have two alleles, right? Two alleles controlling each one of their traits. A phenotype is the appearance uh, of that trait, the physical manifestation, if you will. While a genotype is the actual pairs of alleles carried by an individual. Once again, two alleles, one from each parent. So if someone, well, we'll go back to the P's for a second. If a P is showing as round, that's its phenotype, its physical appearance, its physical manifestation of those genes. But we don't know what the actual genotype is. Their alleles could be big R, little r, or big R, big R, because either one is going to show you the appearance of the phenotype of round. A homozygous genotype is one that has two copies of the same allele. So that would be the big R, big R, or little r, little r. That is as opposed to a heterozygous, where the genotype has two alternatives, big R, little r. And we saw that in Mendel's experiments in that F1 generation that we end up with all heterozygous um, individuals. Then we have dominant versus recessive. So phenotype one, okay, so the physical manifestation. On here we're talking, we're not talking alleles, and this is where it can get confusing. We're talking actually phenotypes, the physical manifestation. The phenotype one, the physical manifestation of one is dominant over phenotype two if the F1 generation of pure breeding strains, so just like Middle's experiments, we had two pure breeding strains and we cross them to get that F1 generation, only shows phenotype one. Only shows, in that example, we had, we, we through true breeding, we knew that we had homozygous round and homozygous wrinkled, we crossed them, and all of a sudden we got a heterozygous and it was only heterozygous that phenotype one they were all round phenotype two on the other hand would be recessive so we saw that wrinkled was recessive and round was dominant so from here on out we're going to follow more of the book but i wanted to kind of give this introduction to you kind of give you a little bit better idea of how all this stuff came about and how we learned it and how the pieces have all come together. All right, so from here on out, we're gonna go a little bit more back to the basics and following the book.